sixth graders, we're so happy to have you join us for worship today. Um, so before we start, I just want to invite us to a time of prayer. Let's just um, spend some time remembering why we're worshiping. And I know it's very distracting, but let's just give this time to the Lord right now. Um, block off all these distractions. And let's just remember our Lord today and give him all of our hearts. invite you in this time in our rooms um, in this time of worship to you Lord God that we will just give you all of our hearts Lord and that we'll remember who you are that you're a good father that you want to meet us personally God you desire intimate relationships with you thank you Lord for this love in your name we pray heard a thousand stories. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're
you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us Lord. to you are Lord. we thank you that you're a good good father that you are a perfect god that we worship that in you um, that you always give us and pour your love on us Lord god thank you that we get to be recipients of your love lord and lord we just want to respond back to you in our love lord we just want to get close to you lord we just want intimacy with you God, your love is so overwhelming. So Lord, um, would you take over our lives, Lord? I just pray that this will not be um, a Sunday confession, but Lord, that it will be a daily walk, that we would invite um, your presence in every single moment of our lives, Lord. So thank you, Lord, and may we be your vessels. In Jesus' name we pray. Today's scripture comes from Acts 2, 1-13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and the Lamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of it and said, they have had too much wine. Hey, TLA Youth family, welcome to this Sunday service. Um, this week, and as you guys know, is a special week, and we want to give a special welcome to our incoming sixth graders. Yeah, we're so uh, excited for the newest members of our TLA Youth uh, joining on this first Sunday for you guys. And uh, we just want to welcome you to this family. Now, later this morning at 10 a.m., we're going to have a large gr group Zoom where we'll be able to kind of interact and get to know one another a little better. Uh, so be sure to tune in for that. Um, but as you guys are here and tuning in to your first Sunday service here in the youth, um, you know, I've heard from some of your siblings, uh, some of even your parents, or maybe from you directly, like that some of you guys are really excited to join youth and that's awesome and we're glad. And like I said, we're excited that you guys are uh, coming up to the youth. But I also heard that some of you guys aren't looking forward to 30 minute sermons uh, in the youth. And um, you know, I don't know where you guys heard such rumors. Our sermons aren't 30 minutes. You know, that would be silly because they're actually more like an hour. Um, just kidding. <laughs> But uh, yes, our youth sermons might be closer to 30 minutes or, um, and probably what you're more used to at Tap Kids was maybe like 10 minutes with some, you know, body worship and some crafts and things like that, which is all awesome. Uh, so all to say, you know, it, it might be a little bit different for you guys, to say the least. It will be a little bit of a transition, and we all recognize that. And I think just um, for myself and the rest of the youth leaders and, and even um, you know, the rest of the youth students that are here, 
you know, we want to welcome you and we want to make sure that this is、um, a space that we can walk with you to transition into this new chapter.、Um, and, you know, change is good, right? Change is not always easy, but it's good because it means that、um, we're growing up. And, yeah, like I said, we just want to make that change and transition as smooth as possible for you guys. So, Speaking of 30 minute sermons,、uh, we want to get started with our sermon for today. And、um, to get you sixth graders caught up a little bit just on what we've been going through、uh, in the youth these past few weeks, we started this sermon series called Story of the Kingdom. And、uh, I know that at Tap Kids, you guys were also going through this series.、Uh, but just to guys, get you guys caught up to speed for what we've been learning in the youth, And we've been emphasizing how this broader like, story in the Bible is actually like the Bible story is one that is a story of the kingdom. And I'm going to provide a very brief summary of this story. For the rest of you,、uh, you know, older youth students, you guys、uh, got kind of this summary like before in our first sermon of the series.、Uh, but just to really briefly summarize, You know, in this story, of course, the main character that we have is this king,、uh, this king of this kingdom, and that main character being God himself. And his kingdom, the setting of this story is in his kingdom, right? But this kingdom isn't necessarily a place, but it's more、um, wherever God rules and reigns in the heart of his people. So at the focus and core of this, this story that we see in the Bible, Is that one of God, his kingdom, which consists of his people? That's like me and you. And so, this is how God first designed creation to live within this kingdom that he's created in Genesis 1 for people to live in loving relationship with himself and to live in loving relationship with one another and with the rest of creation. And everything was supposed to live in perfect harmony. Now,、uh, we know that this original picture gets unfortunately tainted in Genesis 3 with sin entering the picture. And,、uh, and we could define sin just really simply, at least in terms of this, this kingdom、um, way of understanding it, this kingdom perspective. We could just simply define it as rebellion against the king. That's really what sin ultimately is. And it's a rejection of the way of life that he established and that he ordered for the way that life should be lived within his kingdom. It's a rebellion against that design. Now, the rest of the kingdom story that unfolds the, throughout the rest of the Bible is really summarized as God working to solve this issue of sin that kind of totally disrupted the picture of God's kingdom that God has designed. This obviously sin has destroyed our relationship with God and destroyed relationships with others and with creation. And so God is working and has been on a mission to restore that picture. And the answer to that solution ultimately comes in, and this is the number one answer when all else fails, you know that this is the go to for Sunday school questions, right? And that would be Jesus, right? The answer is found in Jesus. So, today we're going to talk about Jesus, or should I say King Jesus, who is in fact the king of this kingdom. And more specifically, he, how we're going to talk about how this king, how we have this king and his presence, and how his presence is with us. Or, in other words, how this king is actually with his people, the people of his kingdom. Now, I want to begin here by talking about this word presence. As we are talking about the presence of the king today. Now, when we think about some of the important people in our lives, and、um, you know, whoever that may be, whether that be our parents, our siblings, maybe it's your teachers at school, maybe it's close friends, maybe it's relatives, whoever those important people may be, you know, what is one of the common things about these people that make them a really significant part of our lives? And of course, there's a lot of aspects that. Can make somebody important in our life. But I would suggest that one of the really core things is their presence, that they are just, they're there and they're with us. 
and they're involved, they're present, and they're available to us, um, that we've had the time and moments to spend together, to build this meaningful relationship and bond together. And on the flip side, a person that isn't really involved at all in our life, that doesn't really have any sort of presence, that we don't really know personally, that we haven't really spent any time with, uh, you know, these people can't really be considered a significant part of our life, right? Because they're just not really there at all. And so when, we, when we're thinking about these significant, meaningful people in our lives, oftentimes the common thing is that these are people whose presence are with us in our lives. And so if we're establishing that presence is a really big part of relationships, the Bible actually tells us that Jesus is the God who is present with us. In fact, we're told at the beginning of Matthew's gospel that his very name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the birth of Jesus is such a significant moment in this kingdom story because uh, remember God's mission since sin entered the picture in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve ate of the apple Since that moment, God's mission has been to restore his kingdom and his presence with his people. That has been his mission. And so Jesus' birth here in this scene is the moment where this is first being realized. God's presence once again with his people. And that's that's who Jesus was. And so as we fast forward uh, to the very last sentence of Matthew's gospel, actually, Jesus promises to his disciples that he is with them. That's the la- that's the very last phrase or sentence in Matthew. That he is with us until the very end of the age. Now, this is a huge part again of the the story of the kingdom. A king who is present with his people. And so the question we want to ask is how is king Jesus's presence with us? And for what purpose is his presence with us. And that's what we want to aim to, to tackle today. And so before we actually get into our main passage in Acts 2, we want to look at Acts 1 uh, to help us better understand what's actually happening in Acts 2. And so remember how we just um, saw how Jesus promised his disciples in Matthew 28 that he will be with them until the very end of the age, right? Ironically, as he said that, right before he's about to ascend, Um, into the sky and he's going to disappear from the disciples like physically he's not going to be with them anymore if there's an irony that jesus says i will be with you to the end of the age and the very next moment he's up on a cloud going away in the sky and saying bye (laughs) and not being seen physically anymore so how will jesus be with us if he just went away removed himself physically from their presence now this is where um enter acts one and we see where jesus promises to send the holy spirit And this is the answer to how Jesus' presence is with us. And that's our first point for today. That King Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit, through his very own spirit. Now we're told in John 14, 17, that the spirit intimately dwells within us. Now, this is sort of a difficult concept to wrap our minds around, right? And if that's you, I mean, you can raise your hand in your bedroom or living room um, because you're not alone. That's the the Holy Spirit dwelling and living inside me. You know, what does that mean? Like, what does that feel like? What, how do, how do I experience that? Like, this is a very difficult thing to kind of wrap our minds around and you're not alone. And I'm on that same boat too. It is a very challenging um, concept, but also like, like reality. Like, what does that mean in my life? And so, uh, but here's one way that I'll try to describe it and the way that Paul actually describes the spirit um, in 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, And he describes what this means in this way. Uh, He says in verses 11 to 12, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, what is Paul describing here? 
I'll try to explain it in this way. Um, you guys like knowing secrets, right? I think that's all of us. Who doesn't like to know secret? When we don't know, like, you know, um, th there's that phrase, curiosity killed a cat, right? We're all curious people and we want to know what we don't know. And so um, let's say in a hypo hypothetical situation, you enter into a conversation between two of your friends. Now they're talking and you could see and you could tell the way that they're talking, like they're talking about something deep, something confidential and perhaps a secret. And you approach them and ask, hey, what are you guys talking about? To which they respond, nothing. And then they'll just, you know, like continue talking amongst themselves, which is so annoying, right? When friends do that. Um, but you're left with a terrible feeling, feeling like you just got excluded from the conversation. And to you, you're imagining like, oh, they must be talking about the latest gossip around school. They're talking about that smarty pants kid from science class and um, how he's a teacher's pet or whatever. And by the way, this is all a hypothetical situation. And I'll use this second to um, get on my soapbox. Guys, we shouldn't gossip. We shouldn't participate in gossip. Um, but anyway, uh, going back to the story. But you keep poking at it and you say, come on, guys, let me know. What are you guys talking about? And your friend finally gives in. And to which he actually tells you, and in tears, I might add, he says, or she says, you know, my mom is really hurt right now in the hospital. She just got into a really bad car accident. And, um, and I'm really scared. And I don't know what's going to happen to her. And the words... Like words can't really describe in this moment as your friend just shared with you a deep part of their heart and their experience at that moment. Words can't really describe the kind of despair and pain that your friend is experiencing in that moment. And it was in that moment that you have just been given access to your friend's deepest parts of their inner life the deepest parts of their emotions and their thoughts, their fears and their desires. And, and this is part of what Paul is describing in this passage, is that in receiving the Spirit of God, we have been actually given access into the deepest parts of God. Uh, his very own thoughts, his emotions, his will and his plans, and his desires. All of these deepest parts of God, he says that it is the spirit of God who knows these things. And the spirit of God, this same spirit of God is the one who dwells within us. And so in other words, to go back to our point that the king, King Jesus is with us through his spirit who dwells within us is to say that we have been brought into a very intimate relationship and union with the king that we can talk to and we can commune with him. And he knows the deepest parts of our hearts and our thoughts and our emotions and our experiences. And we've been invited to know his very own. And we've been given access into this deep fellowship as his spirit dwells within us. This is what it means that the spirit dwells within us and that God's presence, the presence of Jesus is with us through his spirit. So with this intimate union and fellowship in mind that we have with God through his spirit, we'll conclude our time here by briefly looking at our main passage in Acts 2, which leads to our second and final point, which is his presence empowers his people, that the king's presence, in fact, em empowers his people. You know, when I was a kid, I actually moved a lot. Um, and so I had to learn every couple years, starting from like... Um, preschool uh, until like I was like I think 13 or something um, I had to learn how to make new friends at new neighborhood at a new school every couple of years and but I remember the first time going into preschool I remember I was actually really scared in this new environment I was um, left by my parents to fend for myself in this new and scary uh, strange new setting but as soon as my mom or dad came with me to class I felt empowered, just their presence with me. Like if they were to drop me off, like with me and walk me to my class, just their presence made me feel empowered to conquer that day, to do the best crafts that I can, to um, eat the best snacks that I can, to uh, play as best as I can, and to nap, whatever that you do in preschool. 
and I was empowered to do whatever that I that the whatever the day presented before me, and and I was confident to face that day. Um, and perhaps some of you guys can relate. Maybe when you're younger, or even now, like you know, the presence of a loved one is really comforting, right? And it's empowering, and it brings out the best in us. And I would say so even right now, like that is what my wife Jen she does for me. Just her presence in my life helps bring out the best in me through whatever tasks or challenges that I might be facing. And similarly, God's presence through His Holy Spirit, as we see in as we're going to see in Acts two, seem to empower His people to accomplish things that they otherwise would not be able to. And it says so when we look at our passage. When the day of Pentecost arrived, that's just a, a Jewish holiday,、um, and it's a really significant one. But it says that they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So at least in this instance, they were able to speak what the Holy Spirit empowered them to do is to speak in languages that they had never personally learned. And we could keep reading for、um, what this actually accomplishes,、uh, as the Spirit is、um, empowering them to speak these, you know, strange or unknown languages. It、says verse five. Now where they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, "Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? These are basically like uneducated farmers in the countryside. That's what they're meaning when they say that.、Um, and how is it that we hear each of?" Us in his own language, and then they begin to list out all the different regions and areas of the world that they came from, many different languages, and they're hearing it in this one place coming from these uneducated people from the countryside that would in no way otherwise know these various different languages. And so,、um, it resulted in them, as verse seven says, all these people that are gathering and seeing this scene. These people speaking in various tongues and languages. It says it resulted in them being amazed and astonished, and some were mocking them. It says later in verse thirteen, but for many they were being drawn to God. Actually, in this moment, that through whatever the the Holy Spirit was empowering them to do that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do, which in this case again is speaking in languages that they don't know, through that. God was empowering them to be able to、uh, draw others to Himself in that moment, and and this is not part of our passage that we read today, but actually in the following verses in this same chapter, Peter sees this opportunity where these many crowds were gathering around, seeing the scene, and he sees this opportunity and he boldly proclaimed the gospel to the crowds that were that were drawing near, and again through the power of the Holy Spirit. And and we're told after he shares after he shares this sermon,、um, we're told in verse forty one、um, that three thousand people came to receive Jesus, and they became a part of the early church through this moment of the Holy Spirit empowering his people, his presence with us, empowering us to do things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Now, when we asked earlier, what purpose is the King's presence with us for?、Um, You know, well, he's with us to make known this kingdom, this kingdom that we are a part of, and to make that known to all the people out there, and to make invitations to them to also join and be part of this kingdom through the way that we live as citizens of the kingdom, and that's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. He empowers us to live according to the ways of the kingdom, which is. A lot of things, but we can summarize it as love, joy, and peace. He empowers us to live in these radically different ways. If what the world says is despair, hopelessness, and and hatred and anger, what the kingdom of God invites us to and continually live into again 
is a total different way. And so how do we do that? Uh, well, a good starting point and, and always, and this will be always a constant for our journey. Uh, and this is, this is the foundational thing. And it's what we started even in this sermon is to start with the relationship that we have been brought into with King Jesus. That if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've received his spirit who intimately dwells with you. And so his presence is always with you. And so our task for anything that we do in this kingdom life, or in other words, our Christian life, or in other words, I would say just our life, period, because our life um, is hidden with Christ, right? As Paul says, is that we simply walk with the, the king who has made his presence known to us. And so I want to invite us into this time of prayer where we can recognize our king, Jesus Christ, who is with us through his spirit. That if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have received his spirit and his spirit is dwelling within you this moment and every single moment of your life. And so to take this moment just at this time to just recognize that, um, how he is, in fact, he's become our friend because he's embraced us. He walks with us every single moment. And I think the key for us is that um, for us being able to recognize his presence with us, um, that's in a lot of ways the Christian journey is to realize in the day to day our God who is with us and to commune with him and to see like God, what, what are you inviting me to this moment or this day? And to, to walk with him into those spaces. So I wanna encourage you, be strengthened knowing that he is with you. And I wanna invite us to take this time to pray together, to embrace uh, our King and our God who is with us. Um, so let's take this time to pray together.
Guys, I'm so glad to have had this first Sunday、um, in this new year with all of you guys, and especially you sixth graders again.、Um, and so, as I mentioned before,、uh, at at this time or shortly, we're gonna at 10 a.m. go into our large group Zoom, and we'll have this time to just、uh, hang out and get to know one another a little better.、Um, but before that, I'll just close this this portion and this time prayer together. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for、uh, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for、uh, our Lord and King, who has made you known to us, and who has、uh, promised to always be with us. And that promise still stands to this day and every moment of our lives. That those of us who believe in Christ has received your Spirit, and your Spirit. Always, forever dwells in us, and we've been given this intimate friendship and this relationship with you,、um, Father. I just want to pray for us. We want to go deeper into this fellowship that we have with you. We want to grow deeper in our friendship with you. We just want to know you more deeply, and I pray that that would have just such amazing impact on all. Of And every aspect of our life, as we come to know you in deeper ways, and we live into everything that you invite us to,、um, so I want to bless、um, just our people, especially our students, that they can、um, continue in this journey、uh, and in this relationship, and they can experience the God who is always with them. And so we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you, and I will see you guys shortly in our Zoom.